Hi families, my name is Christy Mraz and I'm taking a short break from my toddler to talk to you about play and your kids and the importance of maintaining play at this time. Um, I'm going to talk to you and show you some slides um, that will hopefully make you feel more confident, um, um, more empowered, and more free to encourage your children to play independently. Just so you know who I am, I'm a teacher, I'm in my 20th year. I'm also a writer. I write about things like play and literacy. And I am also a parent. Um, I, you might get to see that in action, who knows, with the, the way the world is these days. Sometimes a naked toddler goes running through my Zoom and sometimes it doesn't. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna get into our topic, which is your child and play. I'm gonna be sharing some slides with you. Um, and, uh, I've tried to make sure if there's any links uh, that they're big enough that you can see at home so you can, you can find some of the original source material if that's helpful for you too. So I am going to head to my screen um, and I'm going to present to you about play. Um, just so you can see, my website is down there, christinemoraz.com. I have lots of resources for families and for teachers to use at this time. Everything is free. I hope you find it useful. I hope it gives you a breath of air um, in your home. So first, let's talk about why play is so important. There's a couple of reasons why play is so critical for our, not only our children, but our species. Um, this quote comes from a document called Play for a Change, which you can find online. Um, one of the things that it says about play, which I think is so critical to think about and to consider, is that kids who play, their brain structure and chemistry develops differently than kids who don't play. Play is what Stuart Brown, um, who I'm gonna talk to about um, a bit more, uh, a little bit later in this presentation, um, talks about how play is the brain's way of inventing itself. There are very few things we can do that light up the brain as much as play for kids. And at this time when we're all feeling high stress, like we wanna make sure our kids don't fall behind or maybe we're just barely holding it together, it's incredibly empowering to know that the thing kids want to do is the thing that's going to help them perhaps the most, and that is play. A little bit more um, uh, research or information to help you feel uh, like it's worthwhile to make sure your child has plenty of time to play comes from a study which um, looked at social competence and future wellness. And you can find the actual study um, right there at the link at the bottom. The quote you're looking at comes from an upworthy.com article. Um, and what it the study basically did was this. It looked at kids entering kindergarten and it found that kids' um, social skills, social competency is a better predictor of long-term success than academic skills. Um, that is to say, kids who enter kindergarten knowing how to share are more successful in the long run than kids who know, enter knowing all their letters and sounds. Um, this is really helpful to know right now because it can feel like our kids may not be making a ton of academic gains and that's okay. Even if they're nine years old, that's okay because it doesn't mean they're not making gains in other ways. Uh, this, our, this quote talks about how when they looked at the study, they found that a single point increase in social competency showed that a child would be 54% more likely to earn a high school diploma, twice as likely to graduate with a college degree, and 46% more likely to have a stable full-time job at age 25. The next question that you're probably asking is, what is social competency? Well, these are some of the things, this is from the study, these are some of the things that um, the, the study looked at. And again, this is all available um, at, the previous, at the previous link. Um, so the study looked at things like a child's ability to function well, distraction, share, accept limits, stay on task, um, uh, work well in a group, right? These are all things that play helps your child develop. They're all things that we can be supporting and facilitating at this time when kids are at home. Things like um, calming down on their own, thinking before acting, um, working and playing without adult support. All of these things help children be successful in the long run. And we probably all can think of someone who doesn't have a ton of social competence in our work life, in our, in our adult social life, for me, I think about an ex of my friends um, who 
was a very, very smart human being and very, very unlikable. And he got fired from job after job after job, not because he wasn't skilled, but because he didn't have things like coping well with failure, accepting things not going his or her way, um, being able to share with others, listening to other people's points of view, right? So one of the things that we wanna think about at this time is, um, we have lots of opportunities to build this skill set um, with our kids in a way that's going to empower them and set them up for success in the future. Kids who gain resilience and independence now will have independence and resilience for the rest of their life. Kids who have their curiosity maintained will remain curious. These are the things that we can help our kids develop um, or to keep going that will serve them for the rest of their lives. So let's talk a little bit about what makes play play. Um, I'm gonna use a little bit of information from Peter Gray to talk about the conditions of play. So play is self-chosen and self-directed. It is very hard to assign someone play. So you can't say to your child, all right, what I want you to go do is, right, and assume that that's going to be play. I have to choose it and I have to be in charge of it. In play, there's an emphasis of process over product. This might be the exact opposite of what your child is experiencing with their online learning, where they're sending things in, worksheets or packets, and those things are being graded. The end product is what's being looked at. In play, what we're looking at is the process, the journey that has gotten us there. Um, players determine and agree upon the rules. So that means your player is in a position of power. They're deciding this is going to be the soccer goal or the cats can talk while I'm playing. The next one is being imaginative, the ability to pretend. That's a huge aspect of, um, of play. And last but not least is being active, alert, and in a non-stressed frame of mind. Being able to um, play means that our kids are um, not stressed out. So perhaps even though it's the last one on the list, it's the most important. Kids at play are usually happy kids. Stuart Brown, who's an author of the book Play, um, just titled Play, talks about play personalities. I'm going to talk a little bit about how he describes play personalities, sort of help you think about how play is more than just toys. Play is actually a way of thinking. You could even call it the play mindset. Stuart Brown um, has broken down play personalities into eight different ways that adults play. You might hear yourself in some of these, or you might um, see your child in some of these. Um, so first things first is the joker. If you are someone who finds a lot of joy and silliness, you love to watch silly movies, you love to read funny books, you like to joke around with others, joking might be your play personality. The stories teller is someone who loves to pretend and get lost, lost in fantasy. So if you're a daydreamer, if you love to read, if you love to watch movies, if you love to um, listen to soundtracks, this might be your play personality. You might be someone who did a lot of um, pretend play as a child. The maker creator loves to make things. You might like to garden. You might like to mow your lawn into special designs. You might like to bake. You might like to do makeup. You might like to do hair. You might like to pick out outfits. But you also might like to paint and draw. You might like to sculpt. You might like to arrange furniture. Maker creators, um, as kids, they often have a lot of office supplies, right? So if your child is always with the tape, always creating something, this might be their play personality. The director is someone who loves to plan. That might sound a little bit funny, but if you think it's as fun to, to, to think about planning your vacation as it is to go on your vacation, you might be a director. Um, you like to organize, you like to make lists, you like to, to think about how, um, how things will go. That is the director play personality. As a child, this tends some, sometimes come across as being a little bossy um, because your child likes to plan. They might be saying, okay, we're gonna play restaurant and I'm gonna be the chef. And you come over and you say, do you have any french fries? And I'm gonna say no. And then, right, they like give you how the game is gonna go. That's how they like to play, they like to direct. The explorer um, likes to find the unknown. Um, this could be reading a book that no one's read before. It could be um, exploring a neighborhood you've never been to before or going on vacation when we can go on vacation again, but not knowing too much about the place. That's where your joy and excitement comes from. Um, 
if your child is an explorer, they probably want to find things out for themselves. They're always curious. What's behind that? What's over there? They want to know. They don't want to do the things everyone else has done before. The competitor likes to put things in, likes to make things games and win them. Um, this can be games like soccer, but it can also be games like cleaning up quick, more quickly than anyone else. Or for me, it shows up when I try to drive somewhere. I always try to beat Google navigation. I always try to get there faster. Um, your child who's a competitor might always be trying to win, um, coming to the dinner table, cleaning up their room, right? They're always making things into games. They're always trying to win them. The collector is someone who finds a lot of joy in having a set, um, having a grouping. So these could be experiences. These could also be um, items. If you're someone who's been to every um, homecoming game with your, uh, with your alma mater, you might be a collector. If you're someone who um, still collects baseball cards or has a, has a coffee cup collection, this could be you. If your child's a collector, they're probably often lining things up on their shelves, right? Um, all the rocks they found, they're bringing leaves, right? Or, or maybe they're collecting Pokemon cards and they're harassing you to get another set, right? The collector finds a lot of joy in building the set. The kinesthete finds a lot of joy through movement. You don't have to be good at it. You just have to love doing it. Of these eight play personalities, you can be a combination, Stuart Brown tells us. So I know myself, I'm a storyteller. I love to read and watch movies. I played a lot of pretend play as a kid. I'm also a maker. I love to make things. I love to arrange my rooms in my apartment. Um, I like to make, you know, little vignettes like they're out of catalogs. Um, but I'm also a competitor. I don't like sports but I like to win things. Um, things like, can I get across the street only stepping on the white lines, right? That's sort of the competitor mindset. Um, your child is emerging as a player, so you might see elements of all of these things. You yourself might um, identify um, some, with these, some of these very strongly. You might have a little bit of all these things with you. Stuart Brown's book, Play, is written for adults, and his thesis statement is we all need to remember this play mindset and to play more. He says that um, the opposite of um, play isn't work. The opposite of play is depression. And so play is a way to get work done. If you have something ahead of you that you really don't want to do, let's say you have to go exercise, the way to help yourself do this, says Stuart Brown, is to bring your play mindset into it. So if you're a um, explorer and you need to exercise, it might be that you try out different exercise classes to try something new, right? If you are right now exercising at home, it might be that you're trying some of the different free online um, websites. If you're a maker, tie your exercise to creation, right? So it could be kneading dough is exhausting. Maybe you're bread making, right? Maybe you have opportunity to work outside in a garden, or maybe you could be one of those people who makes um, art with your Google map, right? When people look at the map of their walk or their run, they've made like a unicorn. Um, a director might enjoy planning their exercise. A storyteller might like being um, listening to a book on tape or listening to an app. I personally love Z Zombies Run, where um, your running is the story, right? A collector might like to do every walk or every run, right, in the neighborhood or every exercise class. The competitor might like to, to keep track of the best classes or the best teachers or their own score. Um, the joker might just wanna do it while, while listening to something funny. This is also true for your child, right? If we can engage their play personality, we can make something more difficult easy. If your child is dreading reading a book, one way we can engage them is by thinking about what they love, right? So your collector might really love having a series to read, and your maker might enjoy dramatizing or creating scenes from their books, and they're gonna have to go back and reread or making a movie out of their book. Your joker is gonna wanna read No David because there's a button there, or Captain Underpants. Your director might wanna plan their reading time. Your explorer might wanna read something that no one else has read. Your kinesthete might wanna read while bouncing on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, 
trampoline, right? Um, or while walking or while doing sit-ups, right? Um, your storyteller might really enjoy narrative nonfiction. So one of the first ways to bring more play and to see play as a way of thinking about work is to understand that play isn't time away from work, it's a way that we work. And so your child can approach anything in a playful way and we can encourage them to do so by engaging that play personality. If they've got to clean their room, set the timer for a competitor, but um, have your maker rearrange their room as they're cleaning it. Um, hide things for your explorer to find. Um, have your storyteller maybe listen to a book on tape as they do it. There's ways in which we can make all things feel more playful for ourselves, but also for our kids. Um, the next thing I just want to talk about some different kinds of play you might want to make sure your child's having access to because all of them have value. The first is fantasy play. So fantasy play is really critical right now. So fantasy play um, for young children is one of the ways that they're becoming literate. They're understanding how stories go. Um, they're reenacting favorite tales. They're understanding cause and effect, beginning, middle, end, narrative structure. As they're doing the dialogue from a movie they love, they are, um, they, are, uh, they are retelling with key details, but they are also learning how to um, make powerful dialogue. Fantasy play is one of the ways that we help our kids become better readers and writers. So when your child's engaging in fantasy play, you can sit back and watch them write stories in the air, right? As they um, as they um, reenact movies they saw or books they've read or things that have happened to them, you're watching them retell, which is one of the skills that they're often being assessed on in school. In addition, this is how many kids are taking care of their mental health right now. Lawrence Cohen, who wrote the book The Opposite of Worry, talks about how when kids feel powerless, they often play powerfully. So if your child is scared or worried right now, you might see a lot more power play. They might be defeating unknown enemies. That unknown enemy is all the things they're afraid of. They might be battling alligators. That alligator is metaphorical or allegorical. They don't know how to put their fears of, of um, coronavirus, of how unsettled things are, of um, food insecurity, of job insecurity. They don't know how to put that into words, so they put it into imaginary play, right? Um, we don't necessarily have to correct our kids when they want to play in those ways because for many of them, it's how they're making sense of the things that they're afraid of. And as they defeat that alligator, um, they start to feel a little more in control of an uncontrollable situation. Games with rules are a great way for your child to play. I'm a huge fan of the Peaceable Kingdom games. Um, I put some, the, uh, an example of one. You can see what it's called right there, Peaceable Kingdom. Peaceable Kingdom games are collaborative. They have them from ages two right on up. Um, the thing that I like about the collaborative games is it's not you versus your child or your child versus their siblings or your child versus whoever they're playing with on Zoom. It's the team versus the game. And so it allows you to um, develop this collaborative spirit that's so important as we see in our world right now. It's how we work together that's helping us through uncertainty. So rather than um, feeding into competition, I'm better than you, I won, it's we all work together, we win together together, we lose together. It's also great for your child to have opportunities to be building right now, building with Legos, building with blocks, building with whatever's in your pantry. Get out the cans and the pasta and let them build structures that way. Um, kids building are, um, are having opportunities to work on their science, technology, engineering, and math skills, right? So those STEM skills, which are things that um, kids need for the rest of their lives, first um, exist in a concrete way, in a concrete experience, so as your kids are building with your pasta boxes and they fall down, they're learning something about engineering, about technology, right? As they try to balance your cans, right? And they, and they, and they see them rolling away. And this is true for seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds. This isn't just like um, 
the, the littlest ones, they're learning about concepts that later technology is, is linked to. Um, my toddler is currently knocking on the door. We'll see how long I can ignore him. Okay, um, rough and tumble play is like the big outdoor play. Climbing and running and tackling and wrestling. This is really critical play for kids. It actually helps them to develop social skills. Um, rough and tumble play is often a form of social bonding. Um, this type of play is not predictive of later violence. As a matter of fact, um, it's actually been found to reduce opportunities for later violence. Um, rough and tumble play can sometimes make us feel nervous, but it's a really healthy part of your child's development. Lawrence Cohen um, wrote a book called Playful Parenting, and in it he has an entire chapter about the value of rough housing. Francis Carlson also writes a lot about big body play, the importance of this running and this wrestling and this making a, making, piling up the pillows on the couch and jumping on them, if that's an okay thing to do, right? That, that those are all ways that kids are learning um, how to self-regulate, um, how to manage big feelings, how to get out energy, but also how to, um, how to bond with others when they may not always feel comfortable with talking. Okay, so a few frequently asked questions about play at home. The first is, if you have an only child, do I have to play with them? The answer is no, right? You can, you want to set your child up to play independently. That is an important and powerful skill set. Um, I have a play packet available on my website um, that has some ideas about how you can support your child in this. Essentially, you say to your child, here's some options. I can fill a Tupperware with water. I can take out some, some items from the pantry for you to, to build with. I can get the pots and pans out or some some clothes that you can dress up with, um, or I can get out the flashlights. Which of those things do you want to do? Okay, great, right? Have your child choose some play items, not necessarily um, traditional ones, but say like, I can get you, like I can, I can take down a bunch of my clothes and you can have my old, my old computer and here's the, here's the, um, you know, if here's some, here's some pot, here's some pans from the kitchen, here's, here's some, um, some other materials, go for it, right? Um, you set your child up to make a plan and then you set a timer for them. Say, okay, so you're gonna, you're gonna have these tools to play with for the next 20 minutes. Then they go off to play. Hopefully 20 minutes will go by, you won't see your child because they're so deeply involved in their play. They might come up to you 15 times within that 20 minutes. We'll talk about that in a second. But it's helpful for your child to have time to play by themselves. It's helping them build their imagination, their inventiveness, their resiliency, their flexibility. As a kindergarten teacher, as a first grade teacher, as a second grade teacher, as a fifth grade teacher, um, one of the things I was always working towards is independent problem solving. The way kids become independent problem solvers is by having times to independently problem solve. Even if you don't have an only child, um, it's okay for you to set your kids up to go and play by themselves. If your child won't play by themselves, it's possible that they, um, that, they're not quite sure how to do that. If that happens, a timer is going to be your friend. Use the timer on your phone, on your stove, on a computer. Say, I'm gonna set the timer for five minutes. You're gonna play for five minutes, and after that, I'm gonna check in with you for two minutes. Then I'm gonna go for five more minutes. Make sure you stick to this. This is like teacher 101. If you say something, stick with it. So if you say to your child, I'm gonna set the timer for five minutes, don't play with them before those five minutes are up. If you say you're gonna play with them for two minutes, play with them for two minutes and then walk away again. Even if all they do is say, when are you coming back? It, that will be a short-term problem, right? But if you continue to, to, set, to, to go and say, okay, just this once, um, you're gonna just this once until they're 25 years old. Um, in the play packet um, on my website, uh, which you can get to, um, I also give some prompts of things to say to your child. They say, I'm bored, or they say, I don't know what to do, or they say, um, I need help, right? Um, some things to say back to them. One thing I would talk about with your child is what's like a caregiver emergency and what's not. So like, when should they come to you? Um, and so, you know, if there's blood involved, come get me, right? For play, you do not need toys. Um, 
part of what helps kids um, build tons of neural pathways and make dynamic um, discoveries and stay curious is when they have to do some inventing. Empty cardboard boxes, toilet paper rolls, um, things from your cabinet, right? Those are all the things that kids can use to play. You don't need to buy them toys. You don't need to buy, um, you don't need to buy inventor kits. You don't need to buy, um, kids can stack rocks. They can use sticks to build. Um, they can use clothespins or different sized crayons as people. You don't need to buy things for kids to play. Um, they just need space and an open-ended material. Save your cardboard, give them your recyclables, right? Um, they can use all of those things to, to, to use their imagination, to develop those literacy skills. Um, this question of shouldn't I be making them do more work? Shouldn't I log on to another website? Should I give them another worksheet? Should I be quizzing them? Lillian Katz, who's one of my favorite researchers, talks about the intellectual skills and academic skills. Um, intellectual skills are things like curiosity and problem solving and resilience. Those are the things kids need to be successful in life. Kids are having all different experiences all across the world right now. They will go back to school. They will have opportunities to, to close academic gaps. We will, teachers will be working night and day to make that happen. The thing that we can do right now is help them stay curious and resilient and interested. Um, the idea that um, more worksheets means your child won't fall behind is, is not true, right? It's, School isn't home and home isn't school and we shouldn't pretend they're the same thing. And what's happening right now isn't homeschooling or even distance learning. It's survival on all counts, right? But if your child is playing, if they're happy, if they figured out how to tape a cardboard tube to a box and make an airplane, they are developing skills that will serve them for the rest of their life. Let them fail in trying to um, build a tower out of your pantry supplies and then let them feel um, powerful when they figure out how to do it the next time. And the last one question, the one that's the most real for me, is just a jokey question, but really set your child up to go play, take care of their joy, but also take care of yours, right? We are in an unprecedented time, possibly. Um, the best thing we can do to care for our child that we that is in our life is to care for ourselves, right? Um, I'm facing job uncertainty. You're facing job uncertainty. When you face job uncertainty, then you're also looking at money uncertainty, and that leads into food uncertainty and housing uncertainty, right? Um, the folks that are going to be okay. Um, mentally are gonna be the ones who make sure they take care of themselves. We're gonna make sure our kids have joy and laughter and time to experiment and explore inside their homes, six feet away from everyone else. And we're gonna make sure that when they're doing that, we also take time to take care of ourselves because that's possibly some of the most important work we can do. It's hard to give to others, but we're not giving to ourselves. I'm going to quickly take you to my website to show you where some of the things are that I've been talking about. It's christymaraz.com. Um, you can read a little bit more about me on my about, but what I'm going to send you to is my blog. Here's my blog. On it, there's all sorts of different things you can be doing. Um, all these inventories and mantras and all those things. But the resource packet for play at home is the thing that I've been referring to. If you have a child who's K to two, you're gonna wanna click on this, pre-K to two. If, you have, um, if you're a Spanish speaker, you can click on it here. If you speak Chinese, you can click on it here. Now, if you are um, a parent of someone who's in three to five, as well, you can click on the three to five, um, and that will give you some, some ideas of what to use at home. Um, just to run you through some of those things that I've been talking about as it shows up, a little letter, some directions to follow for those of you who would like that. Um, and then just some suggestions on different ways, 
sorry, different different choices for playing. Google Drive is always very slow um, as, I, as you're on this. Um, so some different ways to use it. And then at the very end, some ways to talk to your child. And if you wanna give them some planning, you can use that as well. Um, that's for free on my website. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing, bring my face back to you and say it was a pleasure talking with you. I hope you found this helpful. Um, you can reach out to ask questions. You can reach out to your child's teacher to ask questions. Um, I'm on Twitter, you can go through my website um, and everyone stay safe, wash your hands. Thank you.